Welcome back. WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. Uh, I got the city behind me right now and with, you know, NFL free agency and the, the Orioles opening against the Red Sox types. And we've been trying to get this guy on uh, for a couple of months. And there was just, I don't know, just an election and an insurrection and just all sorts of things going on down in Washington, D.C. Uh, he is the author of my all-time favorite uh, NFL uh, book. Uh, the big game is out there. And one of Don Moeller's favorite books on politics in this town. We welcome back in from the New York Times. A very, very busy, like a real journalist, you know, guy mud on the hands journalist. Mark Leibovich joins us again. Man, you're writing another book. I mean, you're dumping back into this uh, Colin Kaepernick NFL thing, or is, is D.C. keeping you busy enough right now? D.C. is keeping me busy. I, I might write a book on D.C. I mean, I, I don't know. There's so many books that are coming out about the Trump years and stuff. I don't know if I want to to revisit all of that, but I might. Um, I think my next book will be a political book. Um, nothing concrete yet, but after that, I'm going back to the toy department. I might do either the NFL or the NBA. What would your, uh, at, at this point, what would the, give me a little overview on the book without giving it all away. I'm not going all out on Gladwell. You have to give me the whole concept, but yeah. just where are you? Because that probably will set the tone for the, the whole conversation above and beyond the NFL, because I mean, I knew of you as a writer, and yeah. when Big Game came out, so many people I knew said it was great. I got it kind of right away, and I fell in love with your writing style and then went back Thank to you. this town and all that. But I, I don't know what to make of this. Don ran Baltimore County, and, you know, we sit here, and we, we do a thing called The Recon now once a week as part of our, like, little podcast thing right. to try to make sense of a time that you've been there a long time and dug in and wrote books on this. This is even something different, right? This is another level. Oh, absolutely. So are we talking, okay, are we talking about football? Are we talking about DC. DC. It, it's another level, but it's calming down. There's no question this thing is calming down. Um, you know, Biden, I think, was not the most exciting candidate, not the most inspiring choice for a lot of people, but he was good enough. And I think a good portion of this country just wanted to calm this thing down. Um, this thing being government, Washington, the people who run your country. Um, you know, I think uh, stolen election claims, 150 um, votes against certification for the electoral college based on very little evidence from what I could tell, an insurrection, people dying, um, political like violence, like inspired certainly by the president um, to a lot of people. I mean, that's a bridge too far. And look, this all had been weighed in on. The, 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 the electorate made its verdict before this. They made it in November. And this sort of affirmed it. I mean, I think Biden has taken a very low key approach. I'll be curious to see what his press conference looks like. But I, I, I think it's not a bad thing at all for the country, for Washington, or for Biden, for, for politics to be boring for a while. Well, Don, I, I want to bring you in on this because, I mean, you, you love the backstory. And, and I, when I told my wife and I handed your, your book, Big Game, I said, you know, you're the best at doing the backstory. Don loves the inside of what's going on there. Uh, Don, for me or Don? Are, are you with Don. it? No, I, I was welcoming Don in. I, don't, I think Don's mic's not where it needs to be. Uh, uh, Don's got me in. But, no, no, go, go ahead. But, but Mark, for, for you, the, <laughs> the, the political intrigue, all of the Trump wacky press conferences and bleach and all yeah. of that. We've had two months of calm and vaccines going in arms. My feeling is if football's normal to bring that, you know, to circle by September, sure. that would be a measuring stick to say, all right, this, this, things are going the right direction for, for this country. No question. No question. I mean, look, I, I don't, I mean, look, I, I, like Don, I'm always hungry for intrigue, for the backstory, for, you know, feuds and quiet stuff. But look, I, I don't, I mean, Trump gave us like a hundred years worth of that stuff. Um, I think we're just all sort of OD. It's, it'd be, you know, what would be nice, and I think what people are very eager for is the pandemic to be behind us so that we can actually enjoy non-political pursuits, like going to a ball game. I mean, I cannot wait to go to a ball game. I, I mean, I'm... I mean, I'm not as, I used to love baseball. I, I really have had a hard time with it for the last 
decade or so. I talk but about it, that every day. I mean, that's why you're here uh, talking politics with me because I yeah. cannot sit in Baltimore and talk about relief pitching right now. It's you know brutal. What I mean? Yeah, it's but baseball's got some real trouble. But what it does have, unlike the other sports, is the ability to on a summer night. There's a game every night. Uh, you can go. You don't have to spend a million dollars. Get a ticket. Get a couple of beers. And we well, do a Fenway ride. Park. I love Fenway Park. I love Camden Yards. I, you know, I love uh, National Park. I mean, it's like it's the the probably the best thing baseball is going for it now is the venues. I mean, there are quite a few good venues, and then unfortunately, the game has to start at a certain point. This whole thing began for for me with you with the NFL and sort of you writing about what was my life. Like literally, I, I read the book. I'm like, I was in the room there. I was in the room there. He read the room there. You like all of the craft stuff and the cherries, like all of that stuff. I, I, the the big piece of you being around then has to be Kaepernick now, right? That that was stick to sports. I mean, I was at Wembley when the Ravens took the first knee on that Sunday morning. It sort of changed. Cancel culture? I got canceled by a lot of people that day, yeah. right? You know, over in London. And the Ravens got their ass kicked. Trump's running the country, SOBs, all of that, right? And now here we are, next presidency for a guy like you that writes books about such things. The, the NFL, as much as you wrote about it, really is a weird sort of thermometer and tone setter for where yeah. all things are because it does involve black and white and right and left and rich and poor and east and west and and, and yeah. tribal is all hell right yeah and they just keep making money right i mean they got this new tv deal and, and stuff look colin kaepernick still is not employed um and you know, I, I, he was blackballed come on he right? was totally blackballed yeah no there's no question about it it's a stain on the league and i think it might be we're get might be getting close to too late to like have him i mean what is it gonna be like well into his 30s now, right? I mean, um, his, his skills, I mean, he was definitely a, either a starting or a fr first tier backup quarterback when he was first blackballed. Um, you know, he would have certainly, he certainly better than a lot of quarterbacks. And now who knows? So yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a stain. I mean, I mean, maybe at this point, if someone actually did sign him, it would be kind of an empty gesture. It'd be like a, kind of like a, a gold watch kind of thing. So, um, yeah, but like, look, America loves football. America absolutely <laughs> loves football. I mean, Baltimore loves the Ravens. I, you know, we had a bad year and my, my guys had a bad year, but we might be coming back um, next year. And, and look, the NFL, I don't love the league. I, they didn't love my book at all. I mean, I'm not, not like they're. No, I mean, I was getting ready to say, let, let, oh, let no, they hate it. Don, no, I, don't, I don't know if you read the book, but I'm going to you know, opine oh, right now. And I'm going to jump in the middle and say, I'm not sure if Roger Goodell really has the shield tattooed on his ass as maybe his wife intimated or didn't. Uh, his wife intimate. was on the record. His wife uh, yeah, you, you know, um, I didn't do the checking. What's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> What's amazing to me with Goodell is that this past year, the Coco aside, right, at 11 o'clock for the draft picks, but mm -hmm. then the league takes this wild left turn, you know, toward equity and inclusion and every commercial break. And, yeah. and it was just – I really, because I, I was here three years ago and Colin Kaepernick's over there. And I remember talking to Anquan Bolden and talking to players about this issue. I remember mm -hmm. talking to players in the Wembley locker room, uh, mm -hmm. you know, after they took the knee first and all hell breaking loose with the Ravens organization and military all along all of that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I tweeted, it makes me want to throw up a little bit in my mouth you know like especially watching the super bowl which was just one gigantic um thing that they swore they would never do three years earlier literally right, right? yeah i mean look the country i mean and, uh, uh, goodell apologized didn't he He said like black lives matter i mean every, look it was over the top it was ham-handed i don't know if it's sincere or not but i guess it's better than nothing i i mean again i'm as cynical as you are i'm as cynical as anyone is um but I think, look, they, they are, if nothing else, a weather vane on where the country is, uh, where they think the country is. And, you know, whether they're, you know, they might be full of shit or quick. Can I say that? Woo. Yeah, you just uh, did. It's great. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Right, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> beat me. I don't know. Like, wow, I forgot. I mean, I get the Zoom. I feel I've like read I'm, your <laughs> work. I mean, I know yeah, you I know, weren't blue. Like, you're like, yeah. there, there is like, there are like regulations here. Anyway, beat me if that's like, we're, we're taped. So do something with that or whatever. <laughs> 
I just don't want to get you guys in trouble. Um, but hey, you know what? I appreciate the gesture. If that's what it was, it might have been an empty gesture, but it's a gesture nonetheless. All right, Don, you're in on this thing. I think your mic's working now. Go for well, it. I don't, I don't know if it's working or not. It is we'll working catch. perfect. Great. You, you'll let me know. Well, Mark, jumping back to the political side, I, I'm always amazed. I spoke to a political insider just the other day, mm -hmm. and they're already polling, which doesn't surprise you, regarding 2022. Mm -hmm. My question for you is what issues – yeah, if you watch 24-hour news cycle, it's one thing after another, after another, after yeah. another, everything's a crisis. Yeah. What issues, if you were writing a preview now for mm -hmm. New York Times Magazine, what issues do you think will be resonating in 2022? It's a great question. I mean, you know, with the caveat that quite often in politics, the thing that you never would talk about could be the thing that everyone's talking about a year from now, like the coronavirus last year. I mean, who in January of 2020 would have been saying, you know, the corona, what was a coronavirus, right? Um, I would say a couple things. I mean, Democrats would love it to be about the economy turning around, um, the virus being sort of kept in check with the vaccines, you know, successful rollout over a number of months, economy coming back. Um, and Trump, they would love to talk about Trump because I think the more involved Trump is in this next midterm election, um, the more disruptive he could be within his own party and the better it is for Democrats. I think Republicans probably want it to be about immigration. Uh, they probably want it to be about cancel culture and like the Democrats sort of maybe they feel overreaching with too much identity politics and too much um, you know, just like getting overly concerned with things that like don't affect don't really, they just seem a little bit much for like Iowa and, and Indiana in the middle of the country. Um, but look, I mean, Trump is not the kind of guy who, if he is healthy and if he is still politically viable, which I assume he will be, uh, he's not going to go away and he's going to put himself right in the middle of the action. He's going to make it known that he is the kingmaker. He sees himself as the kingmaker, um, in which case you're going to have a lot of primaries, Republican primaries, that are going to cause all kinds of problems potentially. So, Well, well okay. that's a question I have for you, Mark. Yeah. I, I'm, boy, that, that's a great segue yeah. because when you talk about Trump or Trumpism, and then these primaries, yeah. I, just some recent articles been written. You, you in fact, may have written one. Um, but these right-wing Trumpist candidates mm -hmm. who, you know, Missouri, the ex-governor yeah. who yeah. resigned in disgrace. Right. And uh, those candidates in the landscape. From where you sit for the grand old party? Oop, I think uh, I lost you there for like the last 15 seconds, Don. Are, they, are, are, those far right, are those far right candidates a real problem for the GOP? Could be. Absolutely. I mean, like, you know, the Trumpier they are, I mean, it could, they could win in like Wyoming and Oklahoma and places like that and probably like Missouri. But once you get a little more purple, like in Ohio, um, or potentially, I mean, there, there could be open seats in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Wisconsin, all of which um, either Democrats won or came very close to winning in, in North Carolina. So um, if, if you get a real Trumpy candidate there, I mean, that's good news for, Repub or for, for Democrats. And then, you know, you have Ohio, you have um, potentially Missouri. I mean, Missouri's pretty red these days, but not as red as Oklahoma. And, you know, they've had Democratic senators as recently as a few years ago and um so yeah if, if like they nominate some off the rails guy who's got some serious problems like the former governor you mentioned eric Cretans, um yeah that could be a real problem for them so they could cough up some seats that should be easy wins for them well who M mark who is the gop this is what nestor and i keep coming back to you know huh. when i look at senator cancun and fist pump hawley yeah. i say to myself and maybe you shed some light on this. Do, does Senator Cancun and Fist Pump Holly, do they believe this far right crazy stuff and they just feel free to say it? Or are they just little boys with their finger in the wind? That's what I can never figure out. Yeah, those two are probably more the latter, I would say. Um, you know, they're really ambitious. They both want to be president. Um, you know, I mean, I think who is the Republican Party? I mean, right now it's still Trump. There's no question about it. I mean, whatever Trump 
I mean, if you look at the Republican platform that they put out last summer, it was whatever Donald Trump wants. I mean, we don't even bother with ideas anymore. Um, they just sort of gave the whole party to the guy. That includes and, not getting a shot, right? Literally, like that's yeah. one of the reasons I'm going to get a shot quicker is because somebody in Missouri just says I'm never getting a shot, right? Yeah, no, no. It, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, there's, there's that. I mean, look, I mean, that's the thing about the coronavirus is this stuff has real, like, um, real world effects right now. I mean, you know, for as long as like half of Trump supporters don't get vaccinated, I mean, we're not getting, there's not gonna be that. So look, I mean, but the party is Donald Trump. And, and I think a lot of them, a lot of Republicans, especially elected Republicans would love to press a button and have him go away, but you can't and expect to keep your job. Um, so you can't hey, win. Hey, Mark, Mark. Yeah. Mark, so I, I apologize for interrupting. Yeah, Don, you're, you're, you're a traditionalist. Go, go, ahead. go ahead. Can you hear me at all? I'm sorry. Yeah, I apologize. Go, go, I don't know what's going on. Go, go, throw your point that, the, that the traditionalist, the McConnells and others post election, would have mm -hmm. taken an opportunity to put a stake through the Donald's heart. And they did exactly the opposite. Try sort that out for me politically. Why didn't they see it was to their advantage? Yeah, I, I think a lot of people thought it was to their advantage. I mean, unfortunately, you know, the, you can't press a button and say Republicans want this, therefore it's going to happen. I mean, there was there were seven Republicans who voted for conviction, which is a lot of Republicans. I mean, by far the most bipartisan impeachment in history. I mean, there have been a lot of them, but yeah, I mean, I think even people who voted against impeachment would love for him to go away, but he can't. I mean, like, he's not going anywhere. It's not, that's just not what he does. And it's not what the voters want. So that's your Republican party right there. It's like what the voters want. And, you know, maybe he's not as like, like, like totally as popular as he was four months ago. Maybe he lost some support around January 6th and, and his conduct after the election, but you know, they could start the primary tomorrow. He'd be, he'd win 50%. There's no question. Do you really that. think anything will happen in New York with, uh, you, you know, attorney generals and such? And obviously the run that's being made at Cuomo now and his yeah. seat, but, but the, the, the notion that he broke laws and should be in jail, yeah, that could I, that's still very much in play in my mind. Oh, no question. I mean, McConnell said as much, you know, McConnell said that in his, um, his on impeachment or in the day they voted against conviction um he's basically said you know prosecutors you can do your thing um i mean he sort of opened opened the kimono on that but um yeah i mean sure it looks like i mean they got a really serious case they've obviously looked at a lot of stuff i mean there are other entities who are looking at stuff whether it's the you know, u.s justice department or the georgia authorities i mean trump has got all kinds of exposure um I mean, precedents suggest that he does tend to, to skate in some way, but who knows? I mean, when you're caught on tape coercing a, a, an election, I mean, it's just, it's kind of a, that's, yeah, th that's so outlandish as the, like, if you were writing a movie, no one would believe that, right? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, he's been writing the movie, he's been writing the same movie for four years now, right? Four and a half years. So, uh, not, I mean, that's the thing about him. He sort of like nothing surprises anybody anymore. And, and everyone just sort of says, yep, that's our guy. And um, I mean, look, I mean, the dirty little secret about politics across the board is that people are pretty loyal to their guy or gal, right? Um, and no one more so than Donald Trump. And I think that, you know, he might be shrinking a governing, I mean, I don't, I don't know if he could get elected president again. I, I'd be kind of dubious about it. But People who are still with him are still with him in a big way. All right. Way yeah, I think he's... Go ahead. Go ahead, Don. No, I was just going to say real quick, I, don't, I can't let Mark get out the door. Mark, if you were fast forward two months from now, where are we with the filibuster? I'm going to put um, you in a time machine. Where are we? Yeah, I don't think it goes anywhere unless there's something really dramatic happens. I mean, look, I, they just don't have the votes. I mean, I don't see them bringing any Republicans over. I don't see Manchin or cinema coming over, um, you know, I think if it happens, it might happen if if Democrats pick up maybe three or four seats in the midterms and they got a little cushion and they don't have to worry about mansion and cinema anymore. Um, and then, you know, they, they could they could really be in business because I mean, it sounds like there's a real appetite to do it. Um, but 
you know, it's 50. Well, it's the only way to get anything done. Nothing's getting done, right? Literally for the people. Well, something's getting done. I mean, they can, they did the party line thing on COVID relief, which is a big deal. Um, I mean, that, that's a, that's a lot of money infused into the economy and it's popular and Republicans don't really want to talk about it. And um, if you could do something similar on infrastructure or get another sort of big victory for Democrats, which would be in conjunction with a, you know, a, a surging economy, which could be the case in a year, um, and a healthier population. I mean, he could really have some wind at his back going into the midterms, especially if the Republicans are as divided as they are right now, which they very well could be, right? So, um, yeah, so that could be set up really well for him, except as we have learned, you just can't predict anything in politics. There's, you know, uh, you know, there's trouble at the border. There's like mass shootings. I mean, like no one wants, I mean, no one was focusing on that six months ago because everyone was too busy, you know, worried about the coronavirus and people still are. But I mean, look, you can't, I think we've all been around too long to, to know that you can count on um, momentum at any given certain, at any certain time. Because I mean, a year ago at this time, or at least maybe a year and two months ago at this time, it looked like Donald Trump was cruising to reelection. So who knows, man? Hey, man, it's always great to visit with you. Uh, you know I love your books. I'll be looking for the next one. I've been preoccupied with that Vancouver Canucks pennant behind you. You know what? Whatever well, that baseball you, is, I don't. Thank you for, thank you for noticing. It, that's a, I found it at a thrift shop right around D.C. I love the old logo. I put it there, and every time I go on, like, MSNBC or something, there's always, like, five or six Canucks fans who say, hey, why do you like the Canucks? <laughs> <laughs> and I have to tell them, like, on Twitter, hey, I don't like the Canucks, but I like the pennant, and I like the old logo. And really, how can you not? I mean, it's got a, that's like, that's not like a throwback thing that was made two months ago. That, that's got to be right from the 70s. So I don't know why it's so great, but, I just, you know, it's just a stick. It's simple. And their nickname is simple, the Canucks. Like, is that like even PC anymore? I mean, who cares? <laughs> well, the flying V was, like, beautiful back in the early It days. was, but that was, like, more modern, right? I mean, that was, anyway. 40 years ago. Yeah, so I'm for it. Mike <laughs> Reno from Loverboy was wearing that when, like, Loverboy was getting lucky. I mean, we're going way back, dude. <laughs> Wait, are they, they are Canadian. Are they from Vancouver? They are, yes. I saw a Mike Reno who looked like he had eaten Mike Reno uh, <laughs> after a, uh, a, 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 a Canada Cup game up there a couple years ago. So, no, I, I was there to see the police reunite. So it was just a little thing going on. To Vancouver? So, yeah, they opened, their, they opened the tour in Vancouver when they reunited. When was this? Oh, seven, eight, nine, eight, they all run together somewhere we can, in there. One day we'll talk about this. Well, you know, we will. And I'll figure out whether I get my Houston Oiler trash can in here. Now that I go with these fake green screen Zoom backgrounds and I'm COVID hair and my rock and roll, dude. Yeah. Uh, but you're in D.C. I'm here. Listen, I owe you dinner. We, you know, I would go to Philomena or something, but we'll do some far or something off the beaten path that's fantastic for D.C. one day. I Sounds need to come good. down to D.C., man. Thank you very yeah, much. Man. It's always great to have you on. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Nestor. Thanks, Don. Thank Mark you, Mitch joining Great us here. Uh, Don with a little technical difficulties, but we work through it. I mean, it's a Catonsville Dundalk thing. We meet in the middle right here in the Inner Harbor. Our friends I think it's Fabies, a plot. It's no, a plot. it's not a big – I know you love believe it so much. So uh, we're going to be over at getting crab cakes. There's going to be a lot of places getting crab cakes. Don and I are doing a weekly, uh, I guess, a series now. Or if I called it a podcast, the kids would listen to it. We're just getting together for a segment every week, just he and I, doing something called The Recon. I hope everybody's checking that out. Now out in the podcast audio vault, anywhere you get podcasts, all of our work, including Luke, getting you ready for opening day. I am Nestor. We are WNST.net, AM 1570. Taos in Baltimore, and we never stop talking. Baltimore positive and crab cakes.